I've been active all my life, and I like to stay active. I always rode my bike, walked. Playing softball is a very important part of my life. And then my knees started to react when I would do exercise. My knees started aching me. I could not run or walk any distance. It was horrible, really. I spent a lot of time uh, by myself because I simply couldn't go out. Playing golf became a job. It wasn't fun anymore. I kept thinking that tomorrow, next week, a month from now, they're going to come out with some new super way to repair these knees. And I was just hoping and waiting for the time that something new and different would come along. When I heard about this macoplasty, I decided that was the way for me to go. So this evening we are going to talk a little bit specifically about a new procedure that's out and I'm going to kind of historically also tell you where this came from and why we're using it today more than what, um, what maybe you've heard in the past, but our main focus is going to be on the macoplasty knee replacement option. Most of y'all know me, I'm Dr. Wilson. I worked here in Wichita Falls for 15 years. My office is just across the street in that green building over there called the Orthopedic Sports Therapy Center. I do joint reconstructive surgery, a lot of arthroscopic surgery and sports medicine. I kind of grew up as a Texas boy, so I stayed in Texas for all my education. I went to my medical school out in Texas Tech, and yes, I became a Texas Tech fan, and. Played, uh, went to some of the games, but it seemed like most of the time they made me sit in the lab and try and learn a little bit, so I didn't really get to go to a lot of games in med school. Then I went on to do my surgery training, and that was at UT Health Science Center in San Antonio, so I spent another five years there doing orthopedic surgery. And as well, they tried to convert me to become a UT fan, so they even sent me to Austin for a little while and spent a little time there and we took care of the sports program while I was there. But it seems like with my training, most of the time I was spent doing this, taking care of people who had accidents, broken bones, broken hips, legs, arms. So I didn't spend a lot of time playing sports when I was doing all this education stuff. But that's kind of where I've been and how I ended up here was after my training, came straight to Wichita Falls and started practicing. I've been here 15 years. This talk this evening, I don't get any kind of royalties off of what we're doing. This is a technology that I've been interested in and I think it's something that's advantageous for our community. The companies that help us to sponsor this is predominantly Stryker. They are the guys who really uh, stood up next to us at the hospital and Kel West has stood behind me to focus on trying to get this thing up and running. <clears throat> and so they're the ones that really I owe the gratitude to for being willing to let us do it. This evening I want to talk to you a little bit about our types of arthritis that are out there, and then what some of the symptoms may be. We'll get more specifically though into our treatments, what we do non-operatively, what we do operatively. For most of y'all, you probably have had times when your knee feels stiff when you sit there for a while. It hurts when you first get up. Many of y'all probably find you can't participate in your normal activities that you used to do when you were younger. I hear that a lot in the office. Maybe you look for an elevator instead of stairs now. Just can't do them. Maybe you try to park close because it's hard. You're not alone. Look at the number at the bottom there. That's 27 million people are gonna suffer with arthritis at some point during their life. So this is a very common problem. This graph just demonstrates different functions that people say they have problems with. The most common things we see is standing for a prolonged period of time or walking. They just, they're limited when they got bad arthritis. There are two types of arthritis. You hear people talk about rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid falls into a group that we lump as the inflammatory, inflammatory arthritis. So osteoarthritis is just what happens to all of us as we age. We cannot 
avoid it. That's going to happen as we get older. We begin to wear down the cartilage. Then we also have a subgroup that are the inflammatory conditions. These are things you don't ask for. You didn't do anything to get it. It developed. So you have this inflammatory problem and you've got rheumatoid arthritis or maybe you have psoriatic arthritis. There are different kinds of arthritis that we lump into that group as inflammatory. The overwhelming majority of people are going to be osteoarthritis. This is just a picture diagram of a rheumatoid knee and an osteoarthritic knee. The rheumatoid knee problem is it's an inflammatory response. It creates inflammation in the knee that eventually will break down your cartilage. The osteoarthritis person simply breaks down the cartilage as time goes on in their life. These are actual pictures of a joint inside. The uh, picture on the left is a very normal looking knee. That's my kids that come in that are 17 years old. They have a beautiful knee inside. The, the, I have a pointer here. This white color, I always tell everybody, looks like a cue ball, and it really does. When you look in their knee with a scope, that cartilage is so perfectly white and pristine and smooth like this. This is how it should look in a healthy knee. This is how it looks in an unhealthy knee. That is actually the bone that you're seeing. You're seeing a little bit of cartilage out here, some cartilage down in here, and this is all, ex all exposed bone. So we never want to see the bone when we look inside your joint because that means you don't have any cartilage to cushion anymore. These are the end stages or late stages. I should mention that other types of arthritis that are a little bit less well known are post-traumatic arthritis. If you had a bad injury when you were young, had to have multiple surgeries on the joint, maybe you're in a car wreck, maybe sports injuries, those people do tend to develop arthritis easier. Maybe younger age, a 50 year old with a bad knee, you found out they had surgeries when they were you know, 20. Well, they, we call that a post-traumatic arthritis. Their trauma in life has led to accelerated wear of the knee. And then you have another rare group of people that get a infected knee joint, and that eventually develops breaking down and wearing of the cartilage. That's called a septic arthritis. So that's a, another small group of people or another type of arthritis. The most common ones, as I mentioned, rheumatoid arthritis, post-traumatic inflammatory arthritis and septic, all of them do the same thing. They all will result over time in wearing down and loss of the cartilage. So osteoarthritis, as we said, is a degenerative bone disease that causes the cartilage in your joint to break down. I always have people ask me, well, isn't the bone bad? There's really nothing wrong with the bone. That's the cartilage in the joint that's wearing down. And so your bone is fine. It's just the cartilage is not so good. It's the most common form of arthritis. 46% of people are gonna get knee arthritis throughout their lifetime. Symptoms, what do you feel? I hear a lot of people with stiffness. That's probably the most common one. Hey, Doc, when I sit down for a few minutes and I try to get up, my knee is so stiff. In fact, I can't even walk. I have to stand there for a minute and then I can kind of get going. Very common to hear that all the time. Swelling, uh, they do notice it, not maybe as common as the stiffness. Some people will tell me, hey, my leg looks crooked. It used to not be this way when I was a kid, but now I've gotten older, my knee looks all crooked. Crepitus means grinding, so sometimes they tell me I can feel it grinding in there. Probably by and large, the biggest thing is just pain. The pain limits me from doing things. I can't get out and do activities. I can't go on vacations with my family now because so we just walk too much. The symptoms can be something that's very gradual, or it can be something that actually onsets pretty quickly. I have, a lot of times people say, well, I must have injured it somehow because I was feeling pretty good, but last month this thing's just been killing me. And you look at their x-rays and they're very worn down and say, well, I think it's your arthritis. Well, golly, that came on so fast. I say, well, at some point it has to begin hurting. I don't know at what point it's going to be, but that's what happened. So the arthritis process is a progression. You don't wake up one day and all of a sudden have pictures like I showed you where there's not any cartilage at all. At first, the cartilage begins to get a little soft. It gets a little bit uh, less pliable. And those are mild symptoms. People may complain that, hey, it hurts when I am up on it all day long and I have to work. I get a little sore in my knee. Um, <clears throat> later on in life, or as there's more wear occurring, you will see that they start having more symptoms, more 
problems with uh, standing or climbing, squatting. You might even be able to change the treatments according to how severely worn the knee is. So early on, we might not really be talking about it, any type of a knee replacement. It may be medications or injections. We might be able to just scope the knee. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Degeneration of the joint. This is just to show you the model. Your cartilage is the most important thing in the knee. That's the color here that they've shown. It's beautifully smooth. As you wear it down, it begins to erode, it begins to wear off. This is actually showing areas of bone. That's the part that's getting bad in your knee. Notice there's not a problem with their bone. The bone's still there. The bone's not dissolving. It's not going away. So it's a cartilage problem, and that's what arthritis is. So some of the conservative things that we do when you first come in and you have some just early symptoms, we might put you on medicine. Tylenols or anti-inflammatories, everybody's familiar with ibuprofen and Motrin or even the prescription ones today like Celebrex and Depro and Relifin. There's a lot of them out there. People may or may not like them. There's side effects. That's the issue you always have to deal with with medications. Sometimes they bother your stomach. Sometimes you can't take them because you've had a heart condition, whatever. And so the medications aren't always the best option. Medica and nutritional supplements. I'll mention this because a lot of people ask me about glucosamine. That's a very common supplement that's used. Glucosamine is actually a, a protein building block for your cartilage. It is combined with many different substances out there. So when you go to the store, you'll get confused. You'll see this bottle and you read it and it says glucosamine along with and they'll have all kinds of stuff that's listed. The active thing that we think is in these medicines is really the glucosamine. That's what we think is providing the biggest benefit. 1,500 milligrams per day is what we recommend. Try it for about three months and see if it helps your symptoms. The only thing that has been shown with that medicine is that it may help your pain. It's a little confusing in the health food market because they're not regulated by the FDA, so their claims that they make do not have to go through rigorous testing in a lab or in studies to show that it really works the way they tell you. A little different than your blood pressure medicine. When we go through and get approval for our blood pressure medicine by the FDA, they have to have very rigorous studies that show when you take this dosage, it does this to your blood pressure, you do this, it does this, and it correlates and it's very clear cut. In the health food industry, it's a little different. They're allowed to say, well, you know, I gave these 10 people here that medicine, they all said they felt better, so it works. You know, it helps them, they're getting around easier. And they can put that on their bottle and you read some of these bottles and they'll say, hey, restores the joint cartilage and does all these things. And I just told you the joint cartilage is what's wearing out. We don't have any real proof that the joint cartilage grows back. But I will tell you there's been some big studies that have been done and they show that 50% of the people who take glucosamine will report, my joint feels better. My knee just doesn't hurt like it used to. So what do we conclude from it? I just tell people don't expect that we're gonna somehow change this picture or this severely worn out cartilage to now look like a normal knee when you were 20. But I will say there's a possibility that if you take this for a while, you might notice your symptoms are better. And after three months, if you've tried this and it feels a lot better, say, so you know what? Good for you, You're a, you uh, respond with this medicine. Keep taking it. If it doesn't help after three months, I tell them save their money. That's about the best we can do with that. But it is a nutritional supplement. Y'all will see this on the stores almost anywhere here in town you can get these glucosamine supplements. Physical therapy can help restore your joint motion. It can restore muscle strength. Physical therapy does not regrow the cartilage though. And so I, I cringe a little bit when I look at some of the guidelines that are required today under Medicare where they say you have to do therapy or they won't even consider letting you have a knee replacement. So what do I do about the person who comes in and they're just bone to bone? It's worn out. That cartilage isn't going to grow back with therapy. Well, yeah, maybe they can maybe help them get their knee move a little better, maybe a little stronger. But in the end run, they're still walking every day bone to bone. And so it's probably not going to be a huge, long lasting relief with therapy. Activity modification is probably the biggest one. In fact, most people come and see me and have already done this. I don't even have to talk to them. 
I like it and I don't like it. I like it because it helps you to feel better. I don't like it because it interferes with your lifestyle so much. When people say, you know, my knee doesn't hurt that bad. And I look at their x-ray and see how terrible it is. I say, you really don't hurt that much, huh? No, I really don't. It's, it's not bad at all. And I look over at their wife and say, well, what does he do? Not much. He sits in the chair all day. <laughs> I say, well, I can fix that. I'm going to write you for a wheelchair, and you can roll around everywhere. And I kind of look at you funny. I say, well, that's what you're doing. You're sitting at home in a chair. You're not going to family reunions anymore. You won't go to the store with your wife. You won't go and do any of these things because your knee hurts all the time. You're basically treating yourself with activity modification, but it's significantly affecting your lifestyle and your quality of life. So I don't necessarily like that treatment. I want to see everybody to try and be able to remain as active as they can and be able to do things. And if it's just their knee that's limiting them, we've got ways to fix that. Don't sit down and do nothing. Weight loss is another one. We'll address that again here in a minute. Some of the treatments, as I said before, this is just a slide diagram where we use weight loss or medications. We may change activities. Just at the end there, surgery in general is really reserved for patients who are not responding with other treatments. And I'll go over that a little bit more in detail. I went the wrong way. Some of the other things that I don't have a, a lot of proof whether they work, but have had people tell me I've used hypnosis for my pain, I've had acupuncture, I've used aromatherapies, aquatic therapies. That's kind of physical therapy, I guess. Glucosamine, we already talked about that as a massage therapy. I guess everybody should get a massage every day, right? That would feel good. Or meditation. I don't know. Some people will report to us that it seems to help with these different things. The non-surgical things. Diet and exercise, of course, is one of the biggest things. I hear people tell me all the time, I need to exercise, Doc. I'm a little overweight. I don't think these two guys can join you. Um, however, they're not going to be able to do a lot of exercise if their knee's completely worn out and hurting the whole time. So we have to try to focus them into exercises that are not so impact on their knee Maybe we put them in aquatics. Maybe we put them on a weight lifting program. Maybe we do a bicycle program, but something that at least allows them to exercise, burn calories, because the weight loss is important if you are overweight. It has been shown very clearly that the amount of pressure in your joint increases as you begin to gain weight. A very simple statistic that I read is if you are 10 pounds overweight, that's about four times that of stress on your knee joint. So multiply that by four, that's 40 extra pounds of pressure on your knee joint. Now some of the patients that come and see me, y'all, are 50 pounds overweight. And you multiply that by four, they're putting 200 extra pounds of pressure on their knee. No wonder their knee hurts. So the weight loss is an important aspect, at least trying to manage the pain. Braces can help. Interestingly, just a simple knee sleeve brace that you put on, puts some compression on the knee, and it, a lot of people tell me that feels better. I don't think it's a long-term treatment. It's not going to fix them for the rest of their life, but it can help them get through a vacation or do a few things with their family if they're looking for some simple things that help. The therapy we've mentioned, medications we've talked a little bit about, glucosamine. We'll go down to the injection part because a lot of people come in and get injections. We have two types of injections that are used predominantly. One is steroid. All of y'all have heard of cortisone shots before. That would be a steroid. And then we have what out there everybody calls them the chicken shots or the rooster shots. Those are viscoelastic injections. Basically what that is is hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid actually happens to be one of the building blocks for your cartilage along with glucosamine. So they've made it into a compound that you inject in the knee and it can help joint pain. They both can be very beneficial in some people. It's amazing how much improvement some people get with these. It's not a rhyme or reason that one's a whole lot better than the other. The corticosteroid only negative effect that I can tell with it is that if you repeat it over and over, it can cause some cartilage damage. I don't worry too much about it with most of the patients who are we're discussing this because they're already in my office with cartilage damage. So I'm not worried about making them a lot worse. I'm worried about getting them comfortable. If you have a 20-year-old and is wanting to have repetitive injections, which they do a lot in professional sports, 
Now you begin to worry because you may break down their cartilage as a young man. That's why you hear a lot of these guys come out of sports at 35 and 40 and 45 and they're already having joint replacements and so. They've had a lot of steroid shot. They've also had a lot of trauma on the joint. So there are some negative effects with steroids. The chicken shots are good. They provide a healthy nutrient or healthy substrate for the cartilage. They provide some lubrication, some cushioning in the knee joint. They're very slow to work. That's the downside. Someone comes in and says, my knee's killing me. Can I have the chicken shots? I say, yes, you can, but it takes about four to six weeks for it to really take full effect. So most people are kind of slow responders and it takes that time, but it can work really well and it can give them six months to a year of improvement. Some of the complications that we can see. You can have an allergic reaction to cortisone. Usually it's the uh, how the medication is preserved. It's not necessarily to the steroid, but it can make the joint swell and be real painful. The chicken shots, the probably the most common thing I hear from that is just that it may have swelled up on me that evening or it may have gotten real sore. So the failure to respond with these other conservative options is what kind of leads us today to start talking about surgical treatments. If you just can't get improvements, we're going to start talking to you about surgeries. There are different surgeries. We may just scope the knee. That's an arthroscopic procedure. Showed you some pictures earlier of a normal looking knee and then a really bad looking knee. Arthroscopy can have some real benefits in people's knees. There's another procedure out there called an osteotomy. I'll explain that a little bit more. And then arthroplasty is your joint replacement. So in the early stage of the symptoms, we might not talk about a knee replacement. We may just look at doing a knee scope. That's an actual picture there of a procedure. They've got the camera put in the knee. We can see it on a monitor, what we're doing. And we get those pictures like we showed you earlier. That is really good for somebody who's just starting to get a little bit of roughening and wear to the cartilage. You can go in and smooth it out and, and boy, they feel a lot better. That's not near as invasive as a whole knee replacement. They don't need that yet. They're in the early stages. As they get a little bit further in the stages though, that cartilage is getting worn enough that a simple scope is not going to fix the problem. Now is when we start getting into the stage of maybe looking at the partial replacements or a macoplasty procedure. And then if the process has really progressed to the late stages, that's when we do a total knee replacement. And that's the last picture here where they're doing the knee. And the diagrams at the bottom are kind of showing you just a little bit of cartilage wear, more moderate, and then severe in all areas here is, may direct our treatment. So here's the arthroscopic surgery. I have people all the time who come in and say, you know, I had my knee cleaned out and it really worked a lot, it really worked well. I, I feel so much better. What we have done when we, do, when we do this procedure, we look at the cartilage and it's a little roughened in places. We'll go in and we'll smooth this out. Your knee doesn't like the rough surface. Your knee was made to glide across a smooth surface with a little lubricating fluid in there. So when you roughen the cartilage or it gets worn, your knee reacts. It doesn't like it and it starts talking to you and says, hey, this hurts. So we can go in with a scope in those early stages and smooth rough places really will benefit them. One of the problems with it though is that as it progresses and gets a little more severe, if you go in there and try to smooth it, it's not as predictable on how well it will relieve their pain. In fact, some of the studies over the years have shown you're probably in a range of 65, 70 percent of the people are going to respond and come back and tell you, hey, this really worked. About 30 percent will say it didn't work. So if I'm talking to somebody and I know their main problem is arthritic, changes in the knee, I'm going to counsel them very heavily about this procedure and the fact that it just may not do the trick. I don't want them to be surprised afterwards if they fall in that 30% group. I do see probably a couple a year will come in and they'll say, have my knee scope. I don't know, they must have done something wrong because I'm not any better at all. It's killing me. And I'll look at everything, x-rays, look at them, sit down and say, well, what did they tell you? Well, they told me it was arthritis, that they, uh, they went there and cleaned up my knee. So they cleaned it up. I said, well, did they tell you there was arthritis? Well, yeah, he said something about there being some arthritis. Okay. Did they tell you that sometimes when you scope a knee with arthritis, it doesn't always relieve the pain? They kind of look at you funny. And I said, well, that's your problem. Y'all didn't talk long enough about this.
before you did it because I think most patients, and rightly so, when we say, hey, we're going to go in and do this surgery, you expect this is going to fix the problem, right? But I think we have an obligation to tell you guys that this doesn't always work. And this is about what the ratio is. 70% of the time, you're going to come back and you're going to say, pretty good guy. 30% of the time, you're going to say, not so good a guy. This didn't work. I think they accept it a lot better if they at least know. And, and, and I get patients that will come in and ask, can we just scope the knee? And I just tell them, sure, we can scope it. I just want you to know this number so that way we know where we're at. There are some other things that I can look at that kind of help guide me. If they're really, really severe bone on bone, no cartilage at all, I'm probably going to try to persuade them a little bit away from that because the numbers probably drop more like 50-50 chance of it helping. That to me is gambling. <laughs> That's not that good. So there are some things. Osteotomy, the concept behind this is that you have an area of cartilage that is wearing down. Maybe in, maybe in just one area, this is what we're going to talk about tonight, mostly people who are wearing predominantly one area, and you come in and you cut their bone, sounds kind of brutal, but we do, we realign it, and what that does is it changes the weight bearing axis, so when you have the bad knee, your weight is coming down through this area, now as we change the alignment on the leg, the weight gets shifted more here. We're pulling the weight bearing off of that bad area, and that can be helpful in a lot of people. It's probably being a little bit replaced nowadays because of our more contemporary knee replacement surgeries like the macoplasty. Not as many people are so excited when you say, well, I'm going to cut your bone, I'm going to realign your leg and put this plate on there and you're going to enjoy this. They, they don't enjoy that idea too much. So, <clears throat> There are complications even though it seems like these are, these are pretty benign procedures, even arthroscopic surgeries can have problems of bleeding, infections, or even blood clots. The cutting the bone, realigning it, you can have problems as well there. It may not relieve all your pain. You may end up with problems with uh, the area you cut doesn't heal completely, so we call that a non-union. Blood clots can happen. So the procedures are not things that you take lightly that you just say, well, no problems at all, this will be easy. So we get to the knee replacement options. And the goal of a knee replacement is that you want to restore their joint function. You want to get them back to activities, and most importantly, you want them to have good pain relief. And the last one in there, I don't think we concentrate on that enough, and that's the longevity. How long is this going to last for me? But how do you tell a 36-year-old you're going to replace her knee? And she needs to understand the longevity part, because we're going to be back in that knee again, and it's not so easy when you come back the second time. So I think that's an important part. When we look at a knee, we're going to look at it from the standpoint of compartments. I want you all to understand this part because it really is the understanding of why we do the macoplasty. You have three parts to the knee that we look at as doctors. You have the inner side of your knee, the outer side of the knee, and then underneath your kneecap. And those are fancy medical words, medial, lateral, patellofemoral. But basically think of it as three compartments, three separate areas. You can have just involvement in one area. I see a lot of people that come in that look like this, just very worn down. That person's almost bone to bone. Very nice space over here. Very nice space underneath their kneecap. That person's going to tell me, you know, every time I get up and do stuff, I hurt right here on the inside of my knee. It just hurts right there. And they're very specific. They'll point for you, show you. But it's because you have no cartilage there. It's just worn out. So that is a very typical wear pattern that we see. You can wear out more than knee. This is somebody that's in the later stages. They've gone for a long time and never really did a lot and it progressed over time. So they're worn out on the medial, the lateral side, even under the kneecap. That's a total knee. You can't do partial. You've got to replace all the areas that are affected. So once we get to these late stages of arthritis, or the point in which that cartilage cannot be repaired or improved, we're going to start talking about replacement surgeries. We might talk about a partial replacement, which is another name is a unicompartmental. That makes more sense now, right? We're talking about compartments, so we're just going to do a uni, which is one compartment replacement. Or we may be replacing the whole knee, in this case tricompartmental. All three compartments need to be replaced. You may see those terms out there. Historically, we have done 
partial knee replacements. So this, what we're talking about tonight, this is really not a new procedure per se. It has been done for over 10 years. The problem with doing a partial knee replacement is that we had to use instrumentation that allowed me as the surgeon to make judgments and make cuts and I had to use my expertise in looking at it and saying, okay, this looks correct. It's, and it's a little hard. It's a little difficult to judge. And so technically, it was a very hard procedure to do um, and get it correct. The implants that we put in there, they're small. There's a lot of contact on those implants and they uh, can wear out very quickly. If you don't get the implants in correctly, then what happens is you're beginning to load and put pressure on the implant in an abnormal way. It would be like me trying to stand on the end of the table over here and wondering why does the end of the table keep popping up versus me standing in the middle. Well, if I can get that thing in correctly and we weight bear right on the middle, we're beautiful. But that's not the way it always worked. These things were so hard to get in and with the instrumentation that we had, we struggled. I'll be honest, I've been there many times, I'm telling you. That's also why I didn't do a lot of them. I've only picked the very fine ones and I said this one doesn't have much problem, it should be pretty straightforward and I think I can get this one in. But it's a reason and just so you'll know, this procedure's been done a long time. But here's some of the problems historically when we looked at them. This knee here was put in and it mismatches. Look at the femur component, tibia component here. It's not lined up, this thing's sitting way off to the edge. It's edge loading. That's not good. That's me standing on the end of the table wondering why does it keep popping up. But look what happened after four years. Femur, tibia, there's your plastic worn all the way through down to the metal. So they just don't last. It's kind of, it'd be like you riding on the edge of your tire everywhere. Over time you wear down the side of the tire. So very hard to get them in correctly. Here's another one. This is the tibial component here setting almost at a 45. You see that? Kind of a funny angle there. Femoral components over here, but it's definitely going to edge load. This one here as well, that tibia is angled down. Femur is going to load right on the edge. So it's, you can pretty much predict that person may do well for a year or two, three, four years. Who knows? They'll be back complaining. My knees bother me because that's worn out. This is one in, in which they put too much spacer in here and I've got it pretty lined but it's very very packed so they overstuffed the joint. They didn't balance it real well and that's another thing that this macroplastic procedure allows us to do is to feel your knee and feel how balanced it is. Your knee needs to have a nice balance or it won't glide nice and smoothly. If you get way too much load on one side the knee gets tight and it doesn't work well and it hurts. So in summary, why did we not do these more? It was just technically a lot more demanding to do. We weren't always comfortable we were gonna get it right versus a total knee. So many of the patients who come in, I just would tell them, hey, we're gonna do a total because I know we could get, the, get it in correctly, even though they only had one compartment involved. This is just, a, again, back looking at the number of them if you looked at total knees, we do 600,000 of these in 2009. We only did 52,000 partial knees. So just from a pure experience standpoint, you're not going to do as many of these, so you're not going to get as good at them when you're having to do only one out of every six or every ten knees that you do. So that really historically brings us up to why did we start looking at the macoplasty? What are the advantages? What is that do. It's a surgeon interactive robot. That robot there is going to help give me a lot of feedback on what we're doing and make sure that I can't vary from what is accurate and precisely being put in your knee. The computer, which is the monitors here, gives us feedback as well and tells us, hey, you're putting this in correctly. It's lined right. It's all according to what we've templated. So we're getting a lot of feedback. It makes it hard to really position it incorrectly because of the way the computer interacts with the robot. The cutting of the bone becomes a very precise um, <clears throat> device and it's very little bone that's actually taken out. So we're bone sparing when we do it. 
So we said before, we have to first look at your knee and figure out what kind of arthritis do you have? Is it mostly on one side? This one here is medial, or is it mostly at the kneecap, patellofemoral joint? Or could it maybe be on the outer side, laterally? Many people are going to have predominantly just one area affected. There's other factors, as I said, you know, you need to look at their age, how deformed is it, how tight is the knee, weight. These other factors may affect whether you're a candidate for it, but certainly the first thing we're going to look at is just how is the knee worn out. The second step we do is we need to take some very special pictures of your knee so that we can put it into the computer and then the computer can show us your actual knee. So we do this by doing a CT scan. The CT scan can do this wonderful thing nowadays. It's called a 3D reconstruction. They take all those slices, put them together, and show us a picture of your knee. It's on a computer. It looks just like that. Say, so you know what? That is your knee. It's nobody else's. It very precisely shows us you. Then we can take it on computer and rotate it, turn it all around, do all kinds of fancy things, and it allows us then to make measurements, tell us exactly what sizes we need to do, where we need to put the implants. So it becomes very specific for that person. The computer then gives the information to the robot, so we'll we use that during the surgery. Jake's going to show you a little bit about that um, in just a minute on how the, they interact. This is a picture, and I I'll kind of go by this because it's preoperatively how we get to look at your knee. That picture on the top right is the actual CT scan. That's that person's knee. It's showing us we've overlaid the component. It shows us how it fits, and we can, he's going to show you how you can move it around, adjust it, and everything. And then it gives us feedback on how that will be in your knee. There's a guidance, so it shows us feedback on when we're cutting. It tells us on this particular model, the green area is what needs to be taken out. The blue is the actual robot, that's the burr. And when we're cutting, it's showing us that and it says, hey, you know what? You need to stay within this little area right here. And when you burr, you just take out the green. And when the green's gone, you burr to the right depth and you burr the right area. If you deviate and you try to get out of the range, maybe I slip, maybe I'm not thinking good, maybe I move this arm over here, guess what? It turns off. So it's a foolproof way of doing it. You just cannot run the machine when you get out of bounds. And once you've templated and it shows you where you need to go, it's, it's just you're piloting it, making it do what it's telling you, what you've already planned. So it's kind of nice. It, it, do, it takes away that surgeon factor where we would sometimes think this looks good and it wasn't quite as good as we thought. And so we get this lined up so precisely and perfect. This is the actual burring process. You can see how that burr is taken off the cartilage. It's very precise. On the top right, you kind of see the green color disappearing. It's showing you that you're taking off that cartilage in the pattern that it, you have already templated. So a very specific way. Once you've taken off the areas that are damaged, then you're going to start placing your implants or trials. So this is a tibial part we put in, has a little plastic insert, and then we have the femoral side, and that's how it fits. It's very simple. It fits exactly where that implant was milled out. If any of y'all have done woodwork, you know what a Dremel tool is. You kind of Dremel just a little area, and you fit. It can be very precise. That's really what this is doing. Once we're completed, This is how it looks when you've done a partial replacement. So this is just one side of the knee. That's the patellofemoral joint, what it looks like when you replace that. And then the next one is the outer side of the knee. And that's how it looks when it's completed. This is just showing you that in the way that this is done, the knee can be replaced in just certain compartments, or we actually have the option we can replace two compartments. I didn't talk a lot about that tonight, but it is available. You can do that. 
in general, what do we see of the benefits? I, and we see a lot less blood loss. I haven't had to transfuse one patient yet doing this. It's less invasive. So the cut's not as big, patients recover easier, there's better range of motion, it's less hospital stay. In general, patients are happier because they're not having to do as much and it's not as uncomfortable. Rehab is shorter. This is an actual picture of a knee. You can see the incision's fairly short. That's about a three to four inch incision. We don't take cut muscle. We can go right into the joint through that. We don't mess with the extensor part of your kneecap or the mechanism that affects your knee. So all of that means that it's gonna be easier for you to recover afterwards. This is what people technically call the minimally invasive surgery. This is an actual picture of one that you, we have done and you've opened it up. You can see the component, the metal component, the tibial down here. You can see kind of the size of that incision. Minimal blood loss, resect a lot less bone, hospital stay is shorter. In fact, every one that I have done have gone home the next day. I actually talked to a guy who's out of Florida and he tells me if he does them early in the morning, he'll let them go home that evening. So it's amazing that you can come in and have a knee replacement and go home the same day. And we literally are doing that here where we do, I do most of my surgeries in the afternoon. So they'll stay that evening, make sure they're comfortable. I saw two this morning, went in and talked to them. They're both doing fine and went home. So they're really here less than 24 hours. So that's why we put 24 to 48 hour hospitalization. I would really say that's more like a 24 hour hospitalization. You can wait bear on it. I let people get up and stand the next day. In fact, I tell them that we're gonna see what you need to get around. I instructed the therapist, I want you to see if they're balanced, if they're safe, they're not gonna stumble, fall. If they need a walker, fine, we'll give you a walker to use. A lot of them don't. Most of them actually can get by with a cane. They walk with a cane. I had one guy who walked out with nothing. So the therapist came in the room, he was standing at the sink washing his hands, and she kind of looked at him and said, how'd you get over here? He said, I walked over here. So he said, you didn't use anything? He said, well, no, I already went to the bathroom. I just came out and washed my hands. And so she said, well, I guess you're not going to need anything. So he walked out. So, but really, they can. They're full weight bearing on it. Their range of motion, this lady has excellent range of motion. You can see that's at three weeks postoperatively, how well she has been in her knee. One caveat I will say to that, the patients who are already stiff before we do the surgery, they're gonna be pretty stiff afterwards. So it won't fix all the stiffness if you have a lot of that before. And I can tell that when I range your knee, if your knee doesn't bend real far, I, I kind of warn you, I say, look, you're gonna feel good, but you're still gonna be a little stiff and you're not gonna get all that motion, not like hers. And it's a quicker return to activities. I have people going back to work now and within two weeks, especially if they sit. You know, if you sit, you can go back in a week as far as I'm concerned. But two weeks if you're walking around, maybe a little longer if you have to do physical carrying, you're carrying stuff that's heavy. This is just some studies that have been done. I just wanna show you what the proof is that this is working. This was a study that was <coughs> comparing total knees to partial knee replacements. So that's your, the UKRs, unicondylar, and then total knee replacements. About the same, 50 and 52. Shorter hospital stay in general for all the unicondylars. Better knee range of motion. 69% of them were able to bend their knee more than 120 degrees, whereas in the total knees, 17%. So just in general, you're gonna see that these patients get better range of motion in their knee when they have this done. Risk of infection in this study was lower for a partial knee than it is a total knee. Probably has a lot to do with just dissection. We're doing it through that minimal inc incision. It's not as open, so it's less likely to get infected. Long-term results, this is what's important for me because I hate to have somebody come back in two years and say, wow, my knee's hurting, doc. You thought you were gonna fix me two years ago and this is killing me. So there are good studies that show that with an accurately placed and appropriately loaded partial replacement, you can get long-term relief with it, long-term benefits. Most of these studies are a range of 95 to 98% 10-year survival. Yeah. But I think the key to all that is accurately placed in position. I just can't stress that enough because that is really what this thing has changed for me. I feel a lot more confident in telling people that we're gonna get this thing in right. It's gonna be in your knee well. It's gonna load well. 
And I think that that means over the long term you have a lot better chance of making it 10 and 12 years and even longer. I re revised one today that actually had been put in pretty well. He was done in 2001. I took it, his is worn out. He made it 13 years, so that's pretty good. I took it out and converted him to a total today. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. Um, but I've had people come in my office who've had them in longer, 15 and 20 years. That's not the norm. But I've also seen people with that other study where you saw those pictures at four years were already worn out because it just wasn't placed in the line real well. So this is a picture, just x-ray before and after. This knee was wearing down so that at a macoplasty you can see that's very well aligned. Here's another one. This is actually a bike company. So you've got the medial part done and the kneecap area on this knee. When you do the multi-compartmental, you're really just again addressing those compartments. In this picture here, it's showing that they've addressed the medial side and they've addressed the kneecap area. That's an actual live picture of what one looks like once it's in. It's very bone conserving. One of the things that's nice about this is it preserves your ligaments. We're not taking all the ligaments out so the knee feels very natural to people. So who are the good candidates that we see? These are, you know, individually based, of course. You gotta look at different things, but people who have pain with activity, pain that's really localized into one area, as we said, those compartments, pain when you get up and you start walking, or stiffness, you're limited with activities, or you're not responding with the more conservative treatments as we went through. How long can I expect it to last? That's going to be different from patient to patient, but I think more importantly to me was the study that I showed you that I really do think we can see a 10-year survival rate up in the 95, 98% range when they're put in correctly. What are the benefits? We've already mentioned a lot of this. Minimally invasive surgery always means that they're going to recover quicker. They're not going to have as much blood loss, so it's less hospital stay. They're going to have a quicker rehab. We see smaller incisions, of course. Patients returning back to active lifestyle very quickly. These are some testimonies from patients uh, that have had this done. This patient said, my knee was keeping me from walking. I couldn't walk, but one, one room to the next. Now it's such a pleasure to have the surgeon recuperate so quickly. My physical therapist has never seen such a rapid response. Well, that you're going to freak out the therapist when you go with this because they're going to say, well, gosh, this is not like my total knees, you know, because my patients are hurting, they can't bend their knees. So you're right. This is a really totally different operation. They're going to recover a lot faster for you. This guy here says that he would walk around, think about it. He's now walks around and says, I hardly even know which knee has the implant anymore. I think that's just a testimony of how natural it feels to them. So that's really concluding what I wanted to present to y'all. If you have questions, I think this is a good time to go through it and also give Jake an opportunity to just show you a little demonstration of what the machine does. While they pick up the questions from you, I guess we'll let Jake show you right quick what the, how the machine interacts with us during surgery to help. And then he can actually go in, and now he would actually, in the surgery, just like, just like a little tool, go in and re-sculpture your knee, put the implants exactly where they go, you're in and out of surgery, and your knee is balanced properly. Now this is, this sounds... For the sake of, of demonstration, I'm gonna take this out so that dust doesn't get everywhere. But if you can see on the screen, this is what he sees in the operating room. And, it, and you can't it, hear it beeping and controlling and allowing him not to really get outside the lines of where he planned that.
My surgery was on a Saturday, and I probably could have gone to work the following Monday, but I decided to take one more day. No pain, no struggle, no suffering, quick recovery. My knees feel now like they did 30 years ago. Macoplasty was the best decision I ever made.